I'm going to sit right here and move these down. Sit right here, David. Joe. I'm afraid I get the middle. You get the middle. Spotlight. New York. Uh, well, hello, everyone. How can I get a ha hello, everyone? <laughs> All right. I, I, I think we got uh, put in the... Uh, the closing spot here, so uh, well, maybe. I'll, I'll close after you. Don't all right, all right. Well, the last, the last panel. So my name is Drew Clark. I'm the CEO of Broadband Breakfast. We are a news and events company based in Washington D.C. And uh, it's it's great to have met many of you over the last couple of days. Well, I've been here. I've known Jeff for 20 years. In fact. Uh, Jeff told a little bit of the story of the polar order earlier. Uh, he, maybe he didn't. He didn't tell the rest of the story, which is how how that got kind of nibbled away and nibbled away and nibbled away by the next chairman of the FCC, Kevin Martin. And uh, I, I think Jeff bought three tables at the Federal Communications Bar Association, their annual chairman's dinner, and uh, you know it was it was it was the dinner that. Uh, kind of went over like a thud because Kevin Martin made jokes about the Kremlin and uh, uh, how, how the FCC <laughs> how the FCC was like the Kremlin and, and, and it was, it was like the Kremlin. But um, so we, we cover, at Broadband Breakfast, we cover politics and technology, or as we like to, uh, you know, motto it up, uh, better broadband, better lives. So for us, that means the infrastructure is vital. We need faster speeds. We need better fiber, we need more wireless, more high capacity wireless, but we also need to kind of understand how it gets used, right? What, what's the end goal of all this, right? And, and this is where, you know, Jeff and many of you, uh, including the passions he's brought to social media and the blockchain fit in. These are all topics we cover. I certainly hope that if it isn't already, it will be on your reading list. Uh, most of our content is free at Broadband Breakfast. We also do weekly, uh, online and uh, webcasts, podcasts, uh, we call them Broadband Breakfast Live Online. I did one yesterday in the green room right through there. Uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing them. Uh, Jeff's, Jeff's been on them, both, both of my guests here have been on different events of Broadband Breakfast. And then we also do events, live events like, like this here. And we've got two coming up in DC. One is on Digital Navigators on November 14th called Connect 20 Summit. And then on December 5th, we've got our Digital Infrastructure Investment Summit, which is the fifth edition. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, say just a word about each of our two panelists, and we'll, we'll dive right in, okay? And a warning, we're gonna be talking about the bottom of the stack, right? I mean, most of this conference has been layers two, three, four, five, you know, up to seven. This is like layer one, and layer zero. Layer zero, layer zero right? I was, you stole my punchline. Sorry, but damn it. Well, David, we, we were talking earlier about <laughs> layer negative one, right? Um, which is to say the policy that Im impacts um, impacts the, the role of, of pole attachments. So, Joe Plotkin, uh, as Jeff likes to say, why don't you introduce yourself to us? Uh, my name is Joe Plotkin. Um, I'm with uh, I'm the Business Development Director for Stealth Communications. Stealth has built its own fiber network. I'll say that again. Its own fiber network here yeah. in New York City. Um, we serve, uh, on the commercial side, we serve uh, businesses around the, the city. Our fiber now extends from the George Washington Bridge down to the Battery and river to river. We can get to basically any address in Manhattan. We have additional fiber in the Bronx in a portion of Brooklyn, and a little, 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 little bit in Queens. Um, um, and we'll talk about uh, those differences. So, so uh, what is what is Stealth's passion? What is, what is the thing you do best? So what we do, we do one thing extra, extraordinarily well. We, we've built a state-of-the-art fiber optic network that, service, uh, that serves um, very high, you know, industrial strength customers, but also you know, a 10 person law firm, but you know, uh, Madison Square Garden, uh, NBC are, 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 are customers of ours, uh, a couple of the agencies in, in New York City, DOT, and, and, and 
collections, um, and we also scale and we scale down, but we do uh, we only do the connectivity. We don't touch any of the apps. We don't touch the LAN. We don't touch uh, any of that stuff. We also do point-to-point -point fiber. We do cloud. Uh, we do uh, dark and dark fiber. But it's really just the raw last. We're a last mile right. provider here in New York, which is rare. Which is rare, and it's all fiber. Great job. All fiber. All fiber. Okay. So, David Guilford, uh, Sidewalk Infrastructure Partners. That's the other SIP, right? We've been talking about SIP. This is the other SIP. David, tell us a little bit about your passion here. Great. Thank, thanks, Drew. It's really great to be here. Again, my name is David Guilford. I'm based here in New York City, where Sidewalk Infrastructure Partners, or SIP, is, is headquartered. Um, my passion really throughout my career is this intersection between innovation, infrastructure, and policy, the, the, you know, the, the political reality that we all inhabit, and whether we call that layer one or layer zero or negative, but it really is a kind of both an, an enabler and a barrier to a lot of the innovation that, that's needed. So SIP as a company is a holding company that has a heritage actually inside of Alphabet, but about four years ago spun out as an independent uh, business that invests in the intersection of technology and infrastructure. So we work in energy, we work in waste, we work in transportation, um, but a big focus uh, for us is telecommunications and broadband, and specifically wireless. And I share more about that in a bit, but really it's this recognition that all of the, the great applications that we all need requires there to be infrastructure that not only can handle the needs of today, but that can, that can also evolve. And as we all know, walking around New York City, just to, you know, to pick up one example, there's the, the challenges that, uh, that, that Joe um, has to deal with on a daily basis, like what's underneath the streets, right? How hard is it to get onto a pole? How do you, how do you actually make sure that the, the connectivity that enables those applications is available, not just in some parts of the city, but really equitably across um, the entire geographies? So that's definitely a motivating factor for, for me in all this, of having lived through COVID like, like all of us and being dependent on connectivity and that kind of, you know, we, we approach this really from that perspective of we're enabling people to be able to be full participants in society and connect to all the applications that they need. Awesome, and that's well setting us up, I hope, for our discussion here. Um, now, we may need to just explain our title, Building Beyond Bead. First of all, how many know what bead means? And not not so many. This is not a layer one audience. No, no, no. This, so B is good. It's, it's good. Crowd. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So B is the broadband equity access and deployment program, and it's like half of my world these days, right? Because B is a very substantial forty two point five billion dollar federal program that is building last mile infrastructure. There are other portions of this 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 effort beyond B that were part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And we actually did a whole conference called the Made in America Summit where we connected the broadband infrastructure investments to the Inflation Reduction Act, Green Energy, and the Semiconductor and Chips Act, and the, the greater push to get uh, chips, uh, uh, you know, advanced process, microprocessing made in the United States. But, but this B program is, again, substantial. But it's not substantial enough that everyone always should talk about it. And we want to talk about beyond BEAD because BEAD has some pretty restrictive rules in the sense that it will be supporting unserved and underserved um, addre addresses, addressable units, right? And that is to say, if you do not have broadband at either 25 megabits down, three megabits up, unserved, or 100 megabits down, 20 megabits up, underserved, then you are not in that market, not in that hard market. But there are many places, like, like for example, Roger Timmerman, the CEO of Utopia Fiber, I mean, he has built some pretty darn good networks, open access networks throughout Utah, now in Idaho and Montana and California, uh, and, and they're often in areas that would not rank as underserved. But these are people who don't like the service. The service is crappy, right? And so, so, so building beyond B could mean, okay, how are we gonna build in those areas that we are not gonna be eligible for B? Or how are we gonna provide, I heard one great discussion yesterday here about you know, the uh, sports arenas or, or MDUs, right? How are we gonna make sure that we literally build beyond the bead. Okay, so the first point that we want to talk about is how hard is it to build infrastructure, okay? And Joe, with, let's, let's let you with, start with this one. With, with, my, with my line, which is infrastructure is hard, it's not an app. Um, no offense to any of the app builders out there, but you know, you don't need a, a team of 
manpower and large equipment moving and permits and the, to dig up the streets of New York uh, to build an app. Um, it's hard, it's really hard and it gets locked in as New Yorkers, we all appreciate our 100 year old plus subway, our aging water pipes that explode from time to time. <laughs> so when you think back of 100 years prior, were they thinking that this stuff would still be running 100 years from now? Infrastructure is 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 all like that. So, um, just to give a, a, a for instance, so in New York City, there's a series of conduits that run under the streets of New York, uh, run by a company called Empire City Subway. It has nothing to do with the subway, the trains. It's it's sub the the, the streets. It they came into existence because of a snowstorm in 1888. I'm not making that up. You can look it up. The, the snowstorm knocked down all the competing telephone lines in the Wall Street and the financial systems. You know, the phone was only invented in 1876. So not much after that, and they all came crashing down in the snowstorm. They said, ah, we gotta put this stuff underground. So consequently, New York City has benefited for the last 100 plus years of having a, a shared conduit system under the ground to run all the telecommunications. So that's why in Manhattan you don't really see poles, but poles are the other way. You can speak to, to, to how the pole, the fights over pole access go. Well, yeah, let's let's talk about that. Poles. You want to start with poles, David? Sure. I mean, I, I guess we have a group of people on stage here that are passionate about, <laughs> about poles and attaching uh, and attachments on them, which is a you know it's a specialized topic, but it is something that really is at the core. Of it, it's a huge impediment. This is, in my view, this is what killed at least the first wave of Google Fiber's efforts is that, that they got stampeded on the incumbent's uh, pole attachment. So, so sorry, continue, David. Yeah. So even though a lot of our infrastructure in New York City is underground and has been underground for a hundred plus years. There's a whole vertical piece of this that um, extends, you know, in part just due to the nature of radio waves, right? Like you can't just put the whole boxes underground in the in the Empire City subway that, that can provide 5G connectivity. Like the physics just don't, don't work that way. So it means that the vertical real estate is, is a relatively scarce commodity, like all New York City real estate. Um, and that means that there's there are processes and there's you know, bureaucracy and very uh, often very sort of challenging processes to go through to get access to that that piece of real estate, you know, you can think of it as virtual real estate, but it's something that you're actually attaching a box on the top of, uh, the, top of the pole. That can be, the, the, the costs and challenges of doing that can be a, sort of a make or break factor for someone that is looking to deploy a wireless network. And it also, it's, it's, not, it's not just a New York City thing, this is something that's being faced everywhere, particularly as 5G requires much greater density of attaching things to poles. And you know, one of the one of the core um, beliefs that, that we have at, at SIP is that there should be better ways to share that physical real estate. And so, rather than having each of the three major network operators, a, you know, any startup Wisps, others that are looking to get access to poles, all competing to um, you know, to go through the process of permitting and then sending trucks and having people climb up and attach these shared wireless infrastructure could actually uh, enable multiple users of that same scarce asset. Now, by each of the three, you're talking about the three main wireless providers, AT&T, exactly. Verizon, T-Mobile, and, and, and we definitely moved in 20 or even less years from a system where Verizon wanted its own towers to a shared infrastructure. I've often wondered, well, will that movement towards shared infrastructure get us towards open access or get us towards sharing of other networks? What, what are your thoughts on, on this question, Joe, in particular? Because one of the big dilemmas that we've talked about is how do you get around the incumbents who can basically stop a lot of action in broadband? Well, let's first, first I'm going to praise the, 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 the good thing, of, so as maybe I jumped ahead too much, but the conduits are an enabler of wireline connectivity. In our case, fiber. Most of, uh, most of the, the others in there are fiber. And it's run on an even-handed basis, um, and so that in New York City, on the commercial side where we, we provide uh, internet and other connectivity, there are six, eight, 10, 12, providers that are in those same conduits who can also get to every address in New York. That doesn't exist in many, many other places. And by the way, I always have to interject my, having been uh, founded a WISP upstate, uh, I used to begin every talk with, everybody wants wireless, but wherever you have wireless, somewhere there is a wire. You need a wire to backhaul all, the, all those cell sites. 
So anyway, for us to bring uh, fiber around New York, we can do it, but so, so we have a, a robust competition. That's not the case uh, in, in many other places. And, it's, and then we have to pull the fiber from that into the building. And one of the ways that, one of the impediments you're seeing now since COVID, everybody working from home sort of highlighted the limitations of the, uh, anybody from our friends at the cable company, from, uh, wild, from cable modem access being wildly asymmetric and, and all those other limitations, they have what's called a point of entry into each apartment building in New York City, which is a lot of apartment buildings. And if somebody wants to provide a uh, competitive service, I'm probably jumping ahead on your question. No, 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 this is but, good. But, but you have to dig up the street and provide service. You have to run your wire separately because uh, those are not shared. That piece of infrastructure is not shared. And so you see these sort of layers of, just like, just like the, 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 the utility poles, uh, the utilities can sometimes drag their feet and, and it's not in their interest to, right. to really jump to it when, when a telco, want, a competitive telco wants to get on the poles. You know, these, these, these impediments are why we're sort of stuck like I said, infrastructure, you know, <laughs> we're trying to get from here to here. If we were starting here, it would be a lot easier. All right, so you've highlighted the inadequacy of um, non-fiber networks, i.e. DOCSIS, you know, uh, coax, because of the wildly uh, symmetrical nature, asymmetrical nature, when symmetrical is so so crucial to getting the apps uh, to, to run. Now, uh, I want to kind of use this to, to, to springboard into well, what are the other hacks, right? What are the other ways around this? And I know we chatted a little bit about Starry, okay, and, and what they did in urban environments. And we focused a little bit here on urban, which is fine. But like, David, let me actually start with you on this. When you look at the landscape for fiber and competitors, what do you see as the kind of things that are, that are breaking the stranglehold of incumbents? What are the things that kind of facilitate new entry for uh, new fiber or new advanced wireless? It's, it's an interesting question because you know, we're talking about beyond speed, and, and you, you shared a bit about how the, the way that sort of that that forty two million dollars has um, the ability to make change, but also limitations around what is right. considered served or unserved. So, for some portion of the country where there just fiber does not exist, it could be transformative in terms of bringing new fiber into a place that just didn't have it available. But the challenge, like when I think about, particularly from a digital equity perspective, is that a, like a lot, if not the majority of households, particularly in urban areas that don't have reliable high-speed broadband at home, they are technically served under you know under the de under that definition because they if they have the money and the credit rating and um, the, and the and the ability to pay you know sixty seventy dollars a month for for service, they could be served. And so there are programs like the Affordable Connectivity uh, Plan that provides thirty dollars a month. In, of subsidy that may or may not continue indefinitely, but the really what it does point to is that there's a need for lower cost service generally, and there's a need for choice. And I think the the, the tricky piece you get into here is no one, whether it's the, the federal government or private investors, wants to build truly redundant infrastructure where it's just it's it's just a waste of, of, of capital expenditures to have say like two pipes when you could have one one that, that's shared. So I think that there's the open access models certainly on the fiber side are, are, a piece of, are a piece of the solution there. You know, some people are hopeful that Starlink and sort of satellite based technologies could, um, <laughs> could offer, uh, offer another option. I think the reality though is that there's nothing that compares to fiber in terms of just the sheer um, amount of bandwidth that can be delivered directly into a home. So I, I, mean, I think innovation in even the like we talk about last mile, but also like the last 50 feet of getting yeah. into an apartment is, is so critical. Um, you know, if anyone's spent time in various older New York City buildings, mm -hmm. and you look at like how the utilities are routed, it's it's really a mess. And not only is it a mess, but there are some of the that some of that wiring that goes from the street all the way into someone's unit was put in by a cable company that may have changed ownership several times. <laughs> it is and it's their, you know, it's their, it's their coax cable in there. And so yeah. it's just kind of a microcosm of what's happening under yeah. the street is that you do need to figure out ways of how do you, how do you actually either piggyback on that old infrastructure or efficiently 
retrofit so that you can have that access. I think nowhere is that more important than in affordable housing in New York City, and that's an area that the state has been uh, thankfully paying quite a bit of attention to. But it's you know it's it's not it's not the like the sexiest piece of this that gets a lot of attention. But even if there is great fiber going right outside your doorstep, if there's no economic way to bring it into your living unit, that is a real problem. I want to make sure and and pivot to include some of the financial issues here. So so uh, I want to talk about from the perspective of, of of SIP and also from from your perspective, Joe. How does private capital make the hard thing we've been talking about infrastructure building easier? Right. So like, so for example, what is the way that SIP approaches the broadband? This is one of your top two or three issues that you you you, you fund and and you it's not a, a it's not you're not operators right so so let's just talk a little bit about what is the portfolio like for both fiber and for the vertical real estate the the, the towers that you're looking to and and maybe if i could kind of advance it a little further still how is b going to impact the work that you've been doing on this already pre -B? So, you know, so as, as, as you point out, we're not a you know, service provider, we're not a, you know, we're, we're not a, a carrier, but we're really focused on that layer between, really between the fiber and the ISP, um, and specifically through uh, the acquisition of a company called Dense Air, we are focused on actively sharing radio hardware. So, we have, if you think about the what a private investor can can bring to the table in a in a project. There's technology, so there, there may be some proprietary or, or uh, technological advantage that they have. There's expertise, people actually go out and build it. And then there's the capital, because in a lot of, in a lot of uh, circumstances, the, particularly if you're talking about a, a municipality, they just don't have the, the capital to put up. So we bring those three things together um, in terms of radio, hardware, the expertise to go through the permitting process, to negotiate the, the contracts and all that, and the, um, and the capital for the active network components. What we don't play is in the fiber or that that piece of infrastructure when we're talking about uh, about broadband. But we do look for partnerships, whether it's with the you know a, a private company like Estelle that has uh, that has their own fiber network. Right. Or in many cases cities and you know, municipalities have built their own fiber network, some of which yeah, some of which are you know, we're funded by, by past federal programs where a number of city buildings in, might be connected so that a, a city hall and a courthouse and schools have fiber that's being used for, um, you know, for, city, for city purposes, but they may be only using 10% of it. And so the ability for, to work with someone like us and where we can commercialize that on their, on their behalf, connect to the poles, to the rooftops, get, get that, that vertical real estate, and then offer, um, offer that wireless infrastructure to the market is a way that can, can go beyond what, what B or programs like that can fund. We definitely want to get Joe's take on the financing, and I did see a question from Dean, which I, I know is very active in the space. So Joe first, and then we'll go to Dean. Uh, it'll be very quick, because I can't really speak to that, because I, well, we're a privately held company, and, and, and I'm not on that side of the, the business, as, as you know. Um, so I might as well just. All right, Dean. Dean. Yeah, I, I just, I, I, I've known that sad for several years. So I'm curious as to sort of whether you see the willingness of uh, existing mobile carriers to use shared radios actually taking off, um, especially if it's in uh, locally shared spectrum. In the US, I'm seeing a little bit of this with like the mocking gateway <coughs> CBRS, but I know that then said in like Ireland and Australia and New Zealand and I think Belgium and, and Portugal, and there's a real sort of tension in terms of getting the operators to use those shared assets, especially if it's not in their spectrum. Are you seeing any shifts? Yes, and I'll just repeat in case uh, I want to hear just a piece of the, the, the question at least is around sort of the, the, the willingness or um, resistance to sharing on the part of the, of the network operators. Um, I think the, the short answer is yes, and it's driven by the, the sheer cost and complexity of the 5G rollout in, in the US that from just a capital efficiency perspective, duplicating the radio infrastructure is a harder thing to defend now than it was five years ago or, or, or 10 years ago. So I'm you know, cautiously optimistic there. I think you know, other, in other countries, it's been in some sense slower, but in other sense faster, and that some of the, the early network sharing uh, did happen, happen elsewhere. Now, I don't know what the exact time frame is gonna look like. Certainly we are hopeful and optimistic that that transition will happen sooner rather than later. Uh, but I think of it as like analogous to before the before the rise of the tower companies, the the resistance 
um, and, or, and, and preference by network operators to own everything. Right, right, and I referenced that earlier. Joe, we've got to give you an, another chance to weigh in on, <laughs> on it, if not, the, the, how did Starry do it, right? And what problems did they run into as an alternative way around the incumbent problem? When you don't have an Empire State uh, subway. Well, they, right, so they, I mean, they have uh, tried to acquire, so for those who don't know, Starry is uh, trying to break that, uh, the residential thing and be a, a residential ISP, uh, mostly through wireless. So they approached us and I'm sure that other companies to provide uh, dark fiber to one tall apartment building in an area and then they think of a circle, like a quarter mile or something, a few blocks, and whatever rooftop, rooftop they could see, they would they would use that bandwidth and distribute it to those other those nearest ten buildings, and then they would either cable down or wireless down. I don't I don't remember exactly how they did it, and they're still doing it, but they they did have to re go through reorganization. There are we have a, we as stealth we do play in the residential space. There are a number of people doing the hard work. We call them MSPs because. Everything in telecom needs an acronym um, <laughs> called managed service providers who do go into these messy, messy, messy uh, old apartment buildings and try and bring uh, right. the wire to, to, to each thing and, and connect them. And we bring them the big pipe. So let me just close with a, uh, a query, which is after it's starting. Like question, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, after starting by deriding apps, my question is, what is the app you are most excited about? Or what, what can be enabled by the better connectivity in your world, right? And so maybe you want to talk about what you, you uh, interacted with the other day. Or, or David, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Last question there. Um, I would, you know, in the, in the early, early days, I always thought it would be, it was some version of video conferencing. I, I will humbly admit that I didn't expect to see people walking down the street doing two-way video conferencing. Mm -hmm. But I think it's already here. In the early days, I was very, very uh, uh, pro-symmetric DSL. Um, symmetric meaning the upstream path has to be robust. Now with cloud, with, with two-way video, Zoom, and all the rest, we, that has been realized. So I, I just think it's, it's gonna be more of that. So maybe it'll be holographic, maybe it'll be immersive environments, et cetera. And I think transportation as an application is, you know, it's already, if you think about where a lot of mobile network activations come from today, that like connected vehicles, just as a vehicle of any sort of system represents such a big, a big chunk of that. And I think that the, the, the bandwidth and latency demands there are going to continue to increase um, potentially exponentially as, as connected and automated vehicles become, um, become more widespread. So that's certainly something that at SIP we're, we're very focused on about thinking about how road infrastructure and telecommunications infrastructure interact. Both have poles, both need fiber and power of the underground way. So uh, I think that, that that intersection and the, the need for low latency kind of edge computing is going to drive some very interesting applications. Well, very good. If you're interested in these topics, we'll be talking about them at the Digital Infrastructure Investment on December uh, 5th in Washington. Please join me in thanking Joe Potkin and David Guilford.